works are and are not mm -hmm. from. Yeah. And uh, one of his most important contributions was the uh, concept of sunyata or emptiness, and believed that sentient beings were devoid of a self and have no underlying essence. And I was confused about all of that. Yeah. Uh, he was also uh, important in the creation of the two, two truths doctrine, which states that if there are uh, two levels of reality within yeah. existence, one being an ultimate reality and one being a superficial reality. Yeah. And uh, he also uh, pronounced that the reality of our world is not an immaterial object, but is rather made up of the relationships between objects and what he had to say about that stuff is very similar to uh, quantum, modern views of quantum and Quantum pieces, right? Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah. That's just yeah. Okay, the only thing I have to add to that is part of the philosophy was uh, represented four positions. All things exist. Um, the permanent of being. All things do not exist. The permanent of non-being. And no, uh, and notions of being and all things both exist or do not exist and all things either exist or do not exist. <laughs> so they kind of, I mean, pretty much, they just cancel each other out is the way I see it. <laughs> okay. But, um, and the other thing was he was um, part of a very famous legend that he was befriended by Nagas, which are snake beings that live in the unseen realms. They appear in the Hindu and the Buddhist myths. The story is the Nagas have been guarding the sutras containing the teachings of the Buddha, which was hidden from mankind for a century. The Nagas gave the sutras and called them wisdoms. So the sutras, am I saying it right, sutras? Um, he took them back to the human world during enlightenment. He supposedly was the second Buddha. Yeah. Okay. That's all I got other than what he what he said. Thank you. I believe I missed the snake being. <laughs> it was like considered a serpent king or something. And lived, he, he went up to the mountains and lived for, in, um, let me see, he visited, he went up to the mountains and lived right, didn't he? And they called it the dragon's place under the sea, I guess is where he was supposedly for like, kind of until he reached enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, his, you see that his pictures, in the, uh, he called it dragons, that would take him, the Naga dragons. Oh, Naga, or the, the silver, silver. That would take him. Uh, according to legend, he went down to the sea. Right. Okay. Uh, to get the sutra, the, the, uh, the professions uh, of wisdom sutra. Um, that's been guarded by, by the Naga. And he is called as the second Buddha. You know why? Because he is the main one who initiated the Mahayana movement, the Mahayana. Mahayana Traditions of philosophy. And later on, when we talk about Zen traditions, Zen, Pure Land, um, uh, Tantric, uh, Tantra, and so forth, all of these traditions that's, that's belong to Mahaya tradition. They consider him as a patriarch, the one who initiates Zen, Pulen, Tantra, and so forth traditions. So his role in Mahayana Buddhism is so important. That's why people consider him as second. And he wrote many, many uh, commentaries and praises about Mahayana tradition, especially the two truth that you, you just mentioned. And let's see. As we are talking about today, Sunata. This one here. And um, he draws 
many different presidents, and especially he's the one who advocates what you call, uh, yeah, gratuities and the, um, what we call the, uh, yeah, middle way. Yeah, middle way. The, uh, yeah. Okay, so, um, and Dalai Lama follow one of his traditions. Let's still assist up to now. Okay, so let's just a brief introduction about him. This is many books uh, that talk about his life, especially his uh, writing. Is that, you're talking about Ashoka? Ashoka? No, 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 Ashoka is different. Okay, Ashoka is a king, an Indian king. Um, he, he was a uh, couple of years after Buddha passed away. Remember the one who I read the Kila and spread uh, out around India and all the other places, other countries. He sent Buddhist missionary to different countries. That's different. He's the king. But this one is he's the Buddhist philosopher. Okay. It's different. Okay. All right, so probably these two this is the more confusion here, right? Okay, let us move on. This one here, Miss Alton. Yes, we have to look um, at it. I had a hard time with this one, but what I found out is that it's the sixth perfection in yeah. the Kron, and it's called Prana Paramita. Yes. Which means the perfection of wisdom. Yes. And it is said that it like it contains all the other perfections. Mm -hmm. And um, that you have to, you, it's, it's basically realization, which is the door to enlightenment, but you have to like go through emptiness in order, in order to obtain wisdom, apparently. Oh, okay. And I also found one of the older texts, uh -huh. it was called, um, it was written around 100 BC, it was called The Perfection of Wisdom in 8,000 Lines. This one. So what's the meaning of profession of wisdom should the word should away. Profession of wisdom what is the meaning? Profession of wisdom. Um, right? No, profession of wisdom. That why that why Narajuna wrote this present about yeah, you would have to uh, you would have to meditate on emptiness. Okay. To okay, to let, yeah. How about this? Let us hear from other people first, other okay. students first, and after that, then we make a conclusion. Okay. And the next one, um, let me see here. Aaron is not here. How about Buchu Hushu Chuan is late. Um, so it's confusion for you too. Or you understand the concept now? You know, you you read my comment. I did not get to read the comment yet. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Um, it's confusion. I mean, I I understand what they're trying to say, but I don't understand how it logically makes sense. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, that's okay. It's no problem. Basically, the Heart Sutra is the most cited sutra of all. Mm -hmm. In Sanskrit, the sutra is composed of fourteen shlokas that contain 32 syllables each. In English it has 16 sentences. It's yeah. not very long. Yeah. There's much debate about where it originated and who the original author was. Um, Edward Kahn's, a Buddhist scholar, estimates it was from 350 CE. But recent scholars um, have said it's probably more like the 6th or 7th century. Yeah. And then there's debate about whether it was first written down in Sanskrit or Chinese. And it appears to be the experience of the Bodhisattva Avalankitsvara. Mm -hmm. And this Bodhisattva has been portrayed as a male and a female in different cultures mm -hmm. and is considered to embody the compassion of all Buddhas. Mm -hmm. And the Heart Sutra, like one piece of it, I just looked at one, one sentence, like the first one. And it says, oh, sorry, putra, form does not differ from the void. The void does not differ from form. 
Form is void, and void is form. The same is true for feelings, perceptions, volitions, and consciousness. So it's trying to say that form is not different than the void, or, or nothingness, I guess. Yeah. That's different. Emptiness here is different. Okay, let's move on. Behind anyone. Um, well, I basically learned the same. I mean, basically have the same thing she did. Um, I did uh, in one of the readings that you put on on course. Um, I found out that it was uh, written somewhere between 200 and 250 CE, and they lived it by Chinese monk. But um, later, um, a Tibetan monk actually created a longer version of it. However, they still use a shorter version in the schools in Tibet. Um, the two main, the two main areas that it focuses on are wisdom and then emptiness. Um, is what is what I found from my research. I also I went and found the English version and um, kind of had a passage from it. I don't know if this is from the short or the long version, but I believe it's probably from the short version. Um, it says form is no different to emptiness. Um, Emptiness no different to form. That which form is emptiness. That which emptiness is form. Hmm. So. Miss um, confusion? Oh, you understand? Well, I kind of took emptiness to be, um, I don't know, kind of like a form of detachment, and I kind of took form to be like a okay. sort of attachment. So that's how I analyzed it. The end, right? Oh, you have you read anything about the question of wisdom, Susan? Yes, I'll look again. Right here. Yeah. It was, um, I got, it was also, uh, it sounds like summed up most of what I had, but uh, it was eight, eight thousand lines of, uh, and, uh, from which is derived the Heart Sutra, which is supposed to be the heart of the perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Um, that's, that's about all I have to add. So, what's the meaning? Um, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Oh, well, it was, uh, I read some stories about how Buddha with some, uh, some stories of how Buddha gave perfection of Wisdom Sutra to a, 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 a flock of swans. And all of those swans went to be reincarnated as people in the next life because of just the inherent wisdom of it. And uh, I don't know about you. I don't really um, understand it. Okay. Okay. I like it. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. You got the, you got the, you know, I wrote, the, uh, yeah, the Heart Sutra. Heart Sutra. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, so what's mean by, the two, two, what's mean by emptiness? Emptiness. Is that nothingness? That, well, I have to say, I don't know what that means. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Okay. Yeah. Right. They think it's nothingness, but it's not nothingness. It's not nothingness. It's not nothingness. It's not nothingness. But it actually, it is, uh, is really getting to the substance and the, and the positive uh, meaning of life. Mm -hmm. It's uh, through emptiness, what we're doing is we're distracted, we're, we're, see, okay, let me read it here, then I'll explain it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, please. Go ahead. A person who successfully meditates on emptiness comes to recognize that nothing is good or bad. But thinking makes it so, makes something good or bad. Why? Can you can you explain it to you? Well, why? Why nothing's good about this because of thinking? Why? Well, uh, because when we, if I was to start thinking, okay, uh, I would I would take things out of out of the proportion of what they really are. When I start thinking my mentality, <coughs> yeah. uh, when I start thinking, <coughs> there starts to be distractions. Because I'm going to think about, I'm going to form my own opinion, uh, discriminate. I'm going to. Yeah, you're right. Let's spell right. Let's see. Yeah. Discriminate? Yeah, yeah. You just, I would discriminate, and my opinions would change the truth of what it really is, because I'm putting in my mind, uh, maybe I'm going a little bit too far, maybe I better bag it up a bit. Uh, but uh, I feel, I find out that emptiness is, is like, okay, like the part of meditation, meditation when you concentrate on the breathing, 
it takes all abstraction thoughts out of my mind, mm -hmm. and I'm more able to focus on on what is really wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, you're gonna have to help me with that piece sure. right there. <laughs> you're on your way. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, this, you finish up your, your yeah. And, uh, Just to summarize it. Okay, I will, yes. Uh, uh, now, can you pronounce this word Prajanparamita? Can you? Oh, Paramita. Yes. Paramita. That's the one that I was trying to find out. Oh, what's the name? Confession. Yeah, go ahead. What, yes. what, is that what that means, perfection? Okay, great. Okay, so. Hmm? The complete of the complete. Okay. So, uh, 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 I had that, and uh, in general, I understand that it's called emptiness or the great void. I think they're both the same meaning. Okay. The great void. Mm. Yeah. Okay, what else? And uh, a lot of people think that it contains absolutely nothing. They think that it, 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 it contains absolutely nothing. However, from a Buddhist perspective, the nature of the great void implies something which does not obstruct other things in which all matters perform their own functions. Calmness and extinction, extinction are the opposite of rising and falling. Mm -hmm. So rising and falling, that's that's part of the worldly existence. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Rising and, and falling. falling. Rising and falling. Part of the, the worldly existence. Positive, negative, good, bad, and so forth. Right? Yes. So we want to we want to alleviate that. We want to get beyond. We want to get beyond that towards trying to find perfect wisdom. Okay. Yes. Okay, let me tell you this story before I move on. This famous monk, when we study Zen tradition, we will come across to him. His name is Lin Chi. He's a very famous Zen master. When he was, when he was novice, um, one day he went to arrest his master. His Zen master, a teacher. A teacher, I had my, my nose. I have my ears, I have my palm, and so forth. How could this sutra? Or should I say, there's no eyes, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, and mind. What's wrong? I have my nose, I have my eyes. And so his teacher didn't reply anything. And when he grew up, he took off to see the other teachers. He learned Zen tradition, Zen meditation, and later on he became a great Zen master. Okay. Now, um, this, of course, this, this kind of concept is, is not for common people, even common Buddhist students there, unless you study. Now, what we talk about here too, too, too. Remember we talked about the review, remember that? Review and A4 part, remember? Left review, right, up, right intention, and so forth. Let's relate to two two here, review. I remember, and in conventional truth, we have to what recognize the law of karma, how it govern our our action, our speech, and even our thought. Right? What you do, what you get. That's conventional truth, and evidence is what we call impermanent. Impermanence. Nothing lasts forever. The chair, the book, and so forth, right? So that truth. Remember when I told you about the truth. The truth is, is, is has happened in the past. It's happening now, and it will happen in the future. That's called the truth in real Buddhist view. If something has has happened in the past, but it doesn't happen anymore. That's not the truth according to Buddhist view. Or if even this true in the past and now, but it, it may not be true in the future. It may not be true. Make sense? Okay, so impermanent, everything is impermanent, right? Whether 
this has been, I said in the past, and now a big open future, right? And we've given uh, our body to, right? And we have to live according to the law of karma. That's understandable, right? That is the creation movement. And that's the creation movement, like you say, things are rising and falling, calmness, disturbance, successful, and failing. Message, good, bad, Right, love <coughs> and hatred. That's a cycle that belongs to conventional truth. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Wealthy, uh, poverty, same too. You understand us? That belongs to what we call conventional, conventional truth. Lastly, and this happened in, in our life, right? But here, the reason why I say paramita is a comprehension of, of wisdom. The Buddha want to uh, mention about this kind of ultimate truth. That is one the important teaching of the Buddha, especially in higher traditions. Now, what is the ultimate truth? Things that go beyond this rise and fall. Things that go beyond love and hatred. Things that go beyond good and bad. Things that go beyond discrimination. And an analysis, a judgment. You understand that? When we have the judgment, when we have some kind of analysis of things, what happened? We will fall into the truth, right? Confession of truth. Good, bad, and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So here, the Buddha talk about something that goes beyond that kind of confession of truth. Simple. What is that? What do you call what? Buddha nature, or pure nature, a goodness nature, um, uh, in Buddhist view, Buddha nature, that is ugly truth. That go beyond our analytical thinking, or our intuition in all the meaning. Make sense? When you pick, when you walk into the room, or when you walk into the a, a, a building or a house, wherever the, the, the place that you have not visited before, you have that type of intuition on the spot before you analyze what happening in that room, how people organize the chair table and so forth, how people decorate their room and so forth. Make sense? That's your intuition. What's here? Make sense now? Let's go beyond your analytical thinking. Go beyond good and bad. Is it understandable? Right? Yes. But if, yeah, what happened? But that's only done through meditation. Yes, and, and we can understand too. And why? Why? When this sutra is negate, no eye, ears, no body, no form, flower, and so forth. Of course, What's mean by, let, let me go back for a little bit. What's my emptiness is form. Form is emptiness. Let me put it this way. Let's say, just, just look at this, let's look at this part, this Y, right? Is that nothingness? Mm -hmm. well. What do you have here? That's just a line. And then raises. It come back. Make sense now? You understand my analogy? Let me explain to you. Before it's not in there, right? Let's let put this frame. Right? This in, inside this frame only. This is white completely, right? Make sense? And it, I draw anything uh, here, right? And this has, let's say, the, the, the snake or the, the worm and so forth, right? Now I erase this. This comes back to emptiness, is that right? So that's what this. This one is for. They say that emptiness does mean but nothingness. But things come because conditions. Things go because of conditions. Things come because conditions. Because I, I use my pen to draw the snake or the worms. Things come because of conditions. And things go because I raise it because of this condition too. Look, um, let me see here. This one, what do you call this? 
cell phone. No, it's not cell phone. <laughs> What's that? Uh, remote control, right? Let me. I, of course, I don't want to take it part. <laughs> I will feel distorted. So it will happen if I take part by part. This yeah, this red button. If you take it out, can it be called remote control? If you take it, this yellow button out, or, um, or the white one out, so can they can they call can they be called st can they still be called remote control? Only when we put the yellow message, we call this this is remote control. Is that real? Is it real? Are you sure? It's real. Is it true? No, it's real or not? Is it real or? How? Huh? No. Yes. You guess no. so. How long can you use this remote control? Probably, let's say, ten years, twenty years. The mice is fifty years, and after that, go to the garbage can. Is that real? You understand that? So again, your laptop, yeah, your books. Anything you see, they can't be closed in condition. When we take them apart, let's like say your watch, right? We take them apart. Nothing you can call as a watch. Is that understandable? Is that clear? Right? So that's what we call, talk about ultimate truth here, not conventional truth. Oh, okay, when we talk about here, yes, it's remote control, we can use it, but it's only in memory. In in, in, short, in a, some periods of time, make sense? It's, it doesn't last forever. That's why we have been permanent here. Make sense? What would be an example of ultimate truth? Yeah, that, that well, I try to talk again. I want to explain. So, again, so I come to the the principle of Sudhyanta or emptiness. Things come because of conditions. Things go because of condition too. Everything doesn't have its own identity. You understand that? Because let's this like remote control on, on my laptop. If I this now, I call this laptop. But when I take it out, part by part, piece by piece, nothing can be called as laptop anymore. Make sense now, right? And what kind of truth would that be? That's that relate to the emptiness. That go beyond this conventional way. That oh, in conventional way, right? We call it chair, the table. In our language, we have different, right? In French, what do you call the chair? What do you call a chair in French? Chair. Chair. And in Japanese, you know. Really? So it's different language, right? That label or this a chair, but you the temporary place, temporary connotation. Uh, or land, or, or the, the, the words, right? You understand that? Okay. So again, emptiness here this doesn't mean nothingness. When we take them apart, nothing we call as remote control, nothing we call as fear, and so forth. That's the reason why it said that emptiness means things lack of its real identities. You understand? You understand that? Emptiness means what now? Lack okay, here make sure. Lack of real identity. Okay. Do you make sense now? Yes. Yes. Mm, and that's why this is a lot of confusion here. The most important, the most misunderstood word in Buddhism. This is article here. This is if you read this, it's called now, here. Um Okay, all phenomena in their own beings are empty. It doesn't mean that all phenomena are empty. This all all beings just mean it doesn't stay it stays separately from others. Um, now, okay, everything is a tentative expression of one seamless, ever-changing la uh, landscape. So. Um, Okay, let, let me move this way here. Um, okay, here. Okay, emptiness of essence 
you understand that? That means I told you, it does, even in our, in our notion now, right? It's real, right? But 100 years from now, who won't be here? Is that real? Mm -hmm. That means it's empty of the essence. That means it never lasts forever. It could not, things could not last forever, right? That phenomena that we experience have no inherent nature by themselves. We can label this remote control, we can label this as the table, right? Um, so this is pretty important. Mm. And um, yeah, you understand?